Genesis 24, 1 through 9. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But that thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou, that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning the matter. Amen. Let's take this time to go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on the scriptures, the sermon, the word of God that the Holy Spirit would prevail, have rule over our hearts, give us understanding of this text of scripture once again. Father, we commit it to you. These are your words, divinely inspired, preserved and kept, and they still have their practical application for our lives today. So the event that took place uh, some 2,000 years ago, we ask, Lord, that uh, you would now bless our hearts by it and instruct us. We commit these words to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to look at the same passage that we looked at last week, only from a different perspective. So for those of you that are here last week, you might think, did the preacher make a typo? And he's like forgetting that you did preach on Genesis 24, 1 through 9, but the focus was on the importance and the value of vows. Jeff and Monica came forward. We had a hybrid wedding recommitment, renewal of wedding vows slash uh, Sunday morning worship service. It was beautiful. I have a book for you. It's on marriage counseling, so we'll give it to you here after the service in my office. But today we want to look at, uh, from a different perspective, a different viewpoint, and that is in this passage of Scripture, the matter of faith or expediency. We face this oftentimes. We know what God's Word has said. We know what God wants us to do. There are, there are explicit statements in the Scriptures that require the activity of faith and our trusting in His Word. But then there are times where we seem to be put between a rock and a hard place. But if we do not do this or that, how are we going to be able to satisfy and fulfill what God wants us to do or has in mind for us to do? And this is where we find Abraham and his servant, Eleazar, in this particular text. Our focus is actually going to be in, in that of verses 5 and 6. And the servant said unto him, Perhaps, peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I need bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. Beware, do not do it. Then when you get down to verse 8, he repeats the statement. And if the women will not be willing to follow me, then they are clear from this my oath. Only bring my, my son thither again. These are astounding words. I think they're very, uh, very good for us. Because we find the servant, he understands the gravity of the oath. He understands also because he's been with uh, Abraham, the, the servant's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 years of age. And, and he has watched Abraham in his journey of faith as he's maturing. He was probably with Abraham when they took Isaac up to Mount Moriah in Genesis chapter 22. And, and, and so he knows what this is all about, that this is about a covenant relationship. God swore unto him that your seed and this land. But the servant brings up a remote possibility. And that is, if we're going to, send, uh, if we're going to get a bride for Isaac, what if... And that's usually the question that we oftentimes ask. What if 
the bride will not come along. Is there a problem if we take Isaac to the Mesopotamian Valley, to your family, and allow him to visit the bride, and then perhaps they will both return? And I want you to observe Abraham's immediate response. The answer to that is no. You dare not take my son to that country. So in that, Abraham essentially put himself in a box. But the boundaries of that box were built upon the promises of God and the faithfulness of God, the ability of God, that he is going to carry out what he said he would do, and we do not need Abraham's help to bring it about. Now, let's explore this a little bit as we look into this passage this morning. So we're going to start out first off with some background. Let's kind of get a feel for the, the narrative, the story that are there, that is there, and, and here's what we find out. Abraham's interest was to do what was right. He wanted to make sure that Isaac would have a bride. It's been some time now that his mother passed away. And we find Isaac kind of off to the side. He, he, he it, basically, he's a, he's a son. He misses his mother. And so, Abraham, wanting to do what is right, because God told him, your seed and this land, and in keeping with that promise, he was once, he sees that it is necessary that Isaac have a bride. So far, so good. In fact, that was the, the practice that the father oftentimes would choose a, a bride for the son. This is a situation where Abraham says, you know what, he doesn't seem like he's all that willing right now. And so in his goodness and his kindness, he calls the servant in and let's make the arrangements. And that part was just fine. But Abraham at the same time realizes uh, that with this necessity of Isaac having a wife in order to fulfill the, thy seed, he must go find a wife for him. And so what he does, calls the servant in and says, you go back to Nahor, you go back to my family, and there the angel of the Lord will go before you, and you bring back a bride for my son. But at the same time, you dare not have him marry a Canaanite woman, nor can he go there. And so we find that in Abraham's willingness to do what is right, he sets parameters that sets limits to what extent we are going to honor the word of God and at the same time not violate the activity of faith or to live in unbelief. So I just want to give you three thoughts out of this passage this morning. Number one, that the desire to live by faith oftentimes brings a trial of faith. The desire to live by faith oftentimes will bring with it the trial of faith. And this is what we have in Abraham's life. The desire, he wanted to please God, and he's going to trust God for the proper bride. But at the same time, this is a test. Because you will notice as we read the instructions that were given to him, you go there, but if she does not return, you're relieved of the oath. End of story. In other words, where's the resolution? Where is the conclusion? What will happen next? Abraham cannot foresee what is actually going to take place. And no further instructions uh, toward bringing about this marriage are given. In other words, we're left with a hanging chad. We're left with what about, or the what if, and suppose, and we do not know. We do not have an answer. So that's the trial of faith. Will Isaac have a bride? Will this son of mine have to wait another 20 or 30 years? How is God going to work this out if only it comes from my family, not from the Canaanites? And besides, we, I can't risk him going back there. So this, this is characteristic of Abraham. He is the man of faith. And he, he, the, the cannot that he lives by, uh, he cannot foresee the outcome. And so he holds fast to two very important truths. Two very important truths that he, he grabs a hold of. Number one, that God will not. And secondly, man must not go back on the original enterprise of God. 
God will not renege on his word. God will not change his mind. God is not going to change the thy seed in this land. And secondly, man, he, Abraham, must not do anything that represents unbelief or anything that is going to go against the way that God is going to bring about your seed, this nation, in this land. And so those are two, two very important uh, elements. This is Abraham's answer. And his answer is basically this. We're going to try to find a bride. If she will not cooperate in the plan that we have, you're off the hook concerning the vow, and the rest is up to God, how it's going to take place. And that could be the real test, the real trial by faith. And so he looks and he quotes in verse 7, The Lord God of heaven which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, in which spake unto me, that swore unto me, saying, so he's going to, he's going to build his entire case. This, ent this whole enterprise is built upon this phrase, unto thy seed I will give this land. And so therefore, we cannot do anything that's going to change the seed element, who he marries, nor are we going to do anything about the land element, where he goes. Isaac is to stay in Canaan. This is the promised land. And the, the seed, the, the generation after him, is going to come from our own family lineage. So there is the test and the trial by faith. You think about this. How many times have we, we said, we're going to live by faith. We are going to trust God to do something. And yet, if we don't do something ourselves, it's almost as if what we believe is not going to come to fruition. And there are many times that we, we face that tension, that kind of dilemma. And the purpose of this text is to teach us that Abraham gives to us a model to follow, an example that we should follow in his steps. That yes, it is good to pursue what is right and to do all that we can to honor the precepts, the principles, the promises of the Word of God. But there comes a point in time where we have to draw the line and say, but I can go no further. Because it's up to God as to how the details, how the solution, the resolution, how the, the end is going to come about. We want to have a, a means that justifies the end. But God says, no, I'll work out those details. So secondly, not only is it the desire to live by faith that brings a trial by faith, but secondly, that living by faith also faces the, the temptation to act for the greater good. When we want to live by faith, there are times when there is a temptation to act for the greater good. And this is sort of what the servant was representing. He put out before Abraham, all right, so if she will not come back, then let's, what if we bring your son to her? Now, at, at a superficial glance, that does not seem to be an issue. He's going to go visit Uncle Nahor, Uncle Nahor. Uh, Laban, and uh, they can work out the details. But yet Abraham also knows this, uh, that to have a wife from his family is God's way, and not to marry a Canaanite is also God's way. But what is the problem if he were to engage in any one of those directions? Well, the problem is twofold. First off, to marry a, a Canaanite woman would, would possibly turn Isaac's heart from God. It would, it would cause his heart to stray, just as it did for King Solomon. Just as Moses told the people in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, that marriages were not to take place between the Hebrews and the local Canaanites or any other nation. Why? Verses 3 and 4, They will turn away thy sons from following me to serve other gods. Now, Abraham is way before Moses' time, but what Abraham understands is the, the little leaven leavens the entire lump. So he's not going to risk the Isaac marrying this. Now, you stop and think about this. Here's Abraham. He has quite the enterprise himself. The man is a huge rancher. He has probably 300 to 500 employees working for him. Cattle and sheep 
lambs, goats, camels, everything that a very vigorous farm ranch would want. And the servant testifies to this when he talks uh, to Laban and tells him, The Lord has blessed my master, which much wealth and gold and silver and cattle. So he was no small farmer in the area. And it would actually have been somewhat to his advantage to gain a political foothold in the land if Isaac were to be allowed to marry into one of the local nations. Therefore, uh, a formidable alliance could have been established, and Abraham could have probably pulled things around and, and, and actually, look, we're going to, I'm going to get the land anyways. This will just help bring it on. You know, sometimes that's how we think. We know what God is going to do. We will just assist God in the process. But Abraham says, no, we can't do this. Because there's the, the greater danger is that Isaac's heart might very well be turned from the Lord. So we're not going to entertain the possibility whatsoever. What about going back to my home country? Let's just say the home country, even though he was a brother, Nahor, and then Laban, those guys are up there. Can we just define them for a moment as maybe half-baked Christians? They understood the God of, his, of, of uh, Jehovah. They understood the God of the Hebrews. But the, the faith wasn't like that of Abraham. They were not tested and tried. And so for Isaac to go back there, it very well could be that he'd want to stay there. Now later on, his own son Jacob would go back, and if you remember, he stayed there for about 14 to 21 years. And it was only because he knew where he was supposed to be that eventually he would pull out. But Isaac, Abraham said, I'm not going to risk it. Because the possibility is that he might be mindful of that country and he may want to return. Now the insight to that statement is given to us out of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 15. When it talks about those people of faith. And the writer gives us this. That they were mindful of that country from which they came and they might have had opportunity to return. Who knows what would have been there. Isaac may have looked and said, you know what, I like this country. I like these people. I love this family. And here is a Rebecca. She is my wife. What is the problem? Abraham, in his wisdom, in his explicit faith, in trusting God, is not going to test Isaac's faith and put him in that predicament where he's going to be tested toward unbelief. But rather, he holds fast to his principles. So what was it that, that uh, Abraham would hold fast to? I want, you, I want you to note that basically we could say this, he developed a mantra. He developed a statement, and it's basically it would go like this. God has said, God is able, and therefore I will not. God has said, he swore to me that your seed, your generations come in this land, from your loins and from your family in this land. God has said that. God is able. Again, Hebrews chapter 11. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we learn there that they believed, Abraham believed that God was able, in this case with Isaac, to raise him from the dead as he was about to offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Hebrews eleven nineteen, God has said, God is able, and therefore, the final answer to all of that is this, I will not, or in the case of what he told the servant, beware that you do not take my son to there. Only do not take my son back to that country. Why? God has made a declaration. He has given to us his word. It is very clear. It is very plain. How that is going to come to fruition is not for us to decide. God is able to do that. And so therefore... We will walk in explicit obedience to what God has told us to do, and that is to live by faith. You see, when we look at the third point, and that is this, the true faith points toward an implicit obedience. This is the faith of Abraham. He knew what God's Word said. He knew that God was able to carry out His own Word, however He was going to do it, but He also understood the limitations. This is what we will not do. Servant, this is what you will not do. 
This is what I will not do. God said it, therefore he is able, and therefore we will not. You see, true faith points to implicit obedience. We normally do not have a problem with what God has said. We're very familiar with the, the, uh, the writing of the Scripture and the direction that God has given to us, the clear principles that are laid out. He's given to us the, everything that has to do with, with life and godliness, and we appreciate that. He speaks to us about our employment. He speaks to us how to worship. He gives us instructions and in what it is to uh, love the Lord and, and what it is to, to find a bride. What kind of friends should we have? How should we work? All of these things God has pointed out for us, and they're quite clear there. But you see, our struggle oftentimes comes with that second part. God is able, yes, or God has said it, but what about can we really believe that God is able? So what Abraham does and what we want to do in our hearts to be able to help us in those times when we're tempted to compromise, when we're tempted to, like, to do what seems to be all right for the greater good. And oftentimes that's the way we look at it. We know what the greater good is, and so therefore a little bit of Compromise over here in order to satisfy the greater good is where we can get ourselves into problems. So we build a faith resolution. When this talk about implicit obedience, the only way that we're going to do this is we have to build a faith resolution in our hearts. And we look at it this way, looking at the same words of Abraham, God has sworn. In other words, because God has given to us all that we need that pertains to life and godliness, church, education, employment, money, all of that. God has given that to us, and so we stand on those principles. What happens if we violate that? Well, think about Samuel, and in 1 Samuel chapter 22, we visit with Samuel and Saul. Here's a case where instructions were given to Saul to destroy all of the Amalekites and the king and all of the animals, everybody. But Saul, wanting to uh, still worship God, does not carry out those instructions. But rather we read in that text of Scripture uh, that he reserves some of the animals for a sacrifice. And in his language, when he answers to Samuel, Samuel says, what is this, the sound of the sheep and the goats in the background? And Saul's answer was simply this. The people, the army, they kept some of the animals because we wanted to use them to worship God. In other words, yeah, you said that, but these animals are suitable and we can still honor God. Samuel's answer to that was this, to obey is better than sacrifice. God delights in obedience, not in your expediency to try and honor him. And so when we build it in our hearts, in our minds, this resolution, we're going to conduct the affairs of our life. We're going to conduct the affairs of the ministry, the affairs of marriage, the affairs that have everything to do with school, with education, our employment, whatever it might be, we look closely and we follow closely which those things which are clearly stated to us in the Word of God. It was a very clear statement given to Abraham as to the seed, his family, and the land. Nobody was to violate that. that were, those were the terms of how that was expressed. Secondly, we look at God is able, that God knows the future. He knows how he's going to bring it about. And so when we go to Hebrews chapter 11, we find, let's go to that chapter because there's a section that we have to read there to really give us a clear picture of what it is to live by. We know that God is able. And then that sheds light on the whole thing. God has sworn. How are we going to, ha how's it going to happen? We're not sure, but we know that God can because he has the ability and the means to do it. 
So in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar, were persuaded of them. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, a heavenly country. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, that he received the promise, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting, reckoning, believing that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, for months also he received him in a figure. By faith, Isaac, and he blessed uh, Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying in Egypt, blessed both sons of Joseph and worship, leaning on top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, he made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Each one of these men rested and staked the future of themselves and their families on the ability to God, reckoning and accounting that God was able. And so that is the kind of resolution that must be built into our hearts, that when we are, are, are tempted to do as Saul did and, and uh, on, try to honor God by some secondary means, or even to take matters into our own hand as Abraham attempted to do with the birth of Ishmael through Hagar, rather, we have to go to the second part of Abraham's life, and that is he was willing to offer Isaac, and yet he knew that even if it was carried out, God would raise him up. Why? Because God is going to honor that war, that word of his, that promise, he swore to me that with my seed, so the only child that he had, the only thing that God can do is raise him from the dead. And so therefore, Abraham acted by faith. So we, we take God at his word. Secondly, we, we trust God in his all-knowing and his ability. And thirdly, we live by, I will not. I will not compromise. I will not surrender my convictions. We have to build those set of convictions in our lives that allow us to have this kind of resolution, this kind of resolve, a mandate in our heart that builds its life on the scriptures, the promises, and everything that God has laid out for us so that we know how to live. And But yet when there come those times whereby it seems as though it's just not going to work out the way it should. Then we have to go back and say, nope, God has sworn it. God is able. Therefore, I will not. Or I will wait. We will trust. We will live by faith. We will apprehend. We will embrace. We are persuaded. We, in other words, we pick up the vision of those people that live by faith. Let's bring it to a close by just these two things. Why would we want to live that way? What difference does it really make? In the immediate sense, it may not make any difference at all because we may not see what the outcome is. You might be dead. Or it may not work out as we had planned. Some things we just, we, we get the results in eternity. But in the meanwhile, there are two very important pre, uh, elements that are of great value to God. Number one, without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11:6. We would do this because the most important thing is we want to honor God by a life of faith, whereby we have this explicit trust. We're going to follow his word. I'm not going to violate it by any manner of compromise, by allowing anything from the outside world to enter in to how we do business in the church or in the family or any, in employment. Not at all. Why? Because I want to live by faith. That's what pleases God. Just just trusting in him. The outcome is his. We're not responsible for the outcome. That is for God. We're responsible for believing in him and seeing that he is quite capable, quite able 
from the track records that he's left for us in Scripture. Secondly, that we might obtain that good report through faith. In chapter 11 and verse 40 of Hebrews, or chapter, 30, or chapter 11 and verse 39, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, they did not receive the promise. They may have wanted to see it happen or somehow or another move it along, but they did not see the promise. In the meanwhile, it was the report card. In the meanwhile, it was a report that would be found in the pages of chapter 11 of Hebrews. You want to see how faith works? Here is a good report, and these people received that good report of their life of faith, of which they were persuaded, they embraced, and they were and if they were mindful of where they come from, they may have returned, but they didn't because they lived according to what God clearly expressed in his word. And that's how we want to live our lives. You know, each year, one of the, this is uh, one of the in, tests and challenges that we, we face when it comes to ministry in the school. Each year, it's a matter of, of staffing. I mean, it's not like everybody runs off on us and we have to come up with new people. But there are times when God moves a staff member, such as Mr. Davis, to another location to serve the Lord. And now we have a spot that needs to be filled. Well, let me tell you something. Not every true born-again believer interested in the philosophy and the world view of South Bay Baptist Church and Clarence School comes pouring into the office and saying, I want that job. You get all manner of recipients and applicants. And each one of those have to be sorted out. Sometimes it gets down to the wire. Sometimes, like it did financially some 10 years ago, it gets down to the wire. What are we going to do? And as as an administrative team, as a staff, the deacons, Mrs. Morrissey, the education committee, we have always looked at it this way. God is very clear in his word as to how we're going to conduct the business and the ministry of the school. God is very clear in his word as to how a church is going to continue, even though the times are telling us that fewer and fewer people are interested in church. For, this, for pertaining to the church, you preach the word. Pertaining to the school, you, you are faithful in those that are going to be ministering education and truth to the student. They have certain prerequisites and prequalifications that must be met, and they dare not be compromised. And so there is that test of faith. God has sworn. God is able. Even though it's a, it can be a painful process, it is a trial of faith. Therefore, we will not compromise those biblical values. We will wait on the Lord. So that pertains to the school. There could be those things that pertain to the church. We have no idea what the future holds for us. But we do know this. God has given instruction that for the church, its primary responsibility is the preaching of the word and the evangelism of the lost. Preaching, teaching, and missions. Education and instruction and proclamation of the scripture. Remain true to the word of God. No matter what, even if it's not inviting, we remain true to what the Scripture have to say, the ministry of the church. And there may be that day when we, we, cross, we come up to that, that crossroad, that threshold. You know, what, what are we going to do now? And all we can do is say, God has told us how to practice ministry. God is able to bring in souls and people to himself to build the gates that will prevail over the gates of hell. And therefore, we dare not in any way or any manner compromise the, the, the words of the Scripture that pertain to the church or to school. And then you carry the same concept into your individual lives, into our families, and wherever else that this challenge is going to be faced. Let's close with a word of prayer. We thank you, Father, that such men as Abraham lived through those kind of struggles, and yet you, you give him a high report, such as that we would 
follow that example and look to you to be able to satisfy and fulfill all the, the direction and all the exhortations and the instructions that we have in the Word of God. Or when we are tempted to want to live by faith, but yet at times to, to do that much might, even if it is for the greater good. Help us to know how to manage those situations and always to look to Thee, knowing that You're not going to leave us. You will not forsake us. You will not fail. There is nothing that You cannot accomplish. And so therefore, Lord, we want to be found faithful. Help us in this endeavor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.